when the only person you communicate with is your twin. Sharing a secret language in an isolated world, life takes on a mysterious and haunting dimension. For June and Jennifer Gibbons, this was not just a bond, but an all-consuming reality. Welcome back everybody! Today, we will immerse ourselves in the lives of June and Jennifer Gibbons, also known as the Silent Twins. But before we go deeper into the story, I wanted to thank you all for watching. I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you so much for being here. Now let's get back to the video. Their parents, Gloria, a housewife, and Aubrey, a Royal Air Force technician, were immigrants of Caribbean origin who moved to the United Kingdom in the early 60s as part of the Windrush generation. In 1963, the family relocated to British forces Aden, Yemen, where Aubrey would serve in the RAF. June and Jennifer were born on the 11th of April, 1963, at a military hospital in the same location. Soon, the family moved back to England, and in 1974, they finally settled in Haverford West, Wales. From an early age, it was clear that the twins were different. They had their own language, a fast-spoken version of Bajan Creole that became completely unintelligible to those around them, becoming a private code understood only by them. This is called cryptophagia or twin speech in simpler terms. It's a common phenomenon that happens in up to 50% of young twins, and a possible reason is the intensive interaction between the siblings. Most of the time, the kids just grow out of it, but in some cases, it persists, and the siblings become isolated and unable to communicate properly with the outside world. In 2023, June Gibbons said, I quote, We had a speech impediment. Our parents couldn't understand the word that we were saying. Nobody understood. So we stopped talking. The only person they talked to was their younger sister, Rosie, who was their roommate. Until she moved to another room, then they stopped talking to her as well. At school, their silence and reluctance to interact with others led to bullying and further isolation. Also, the fact that they were the only children of color at the school didn't help their cause either. Teachers and classmates were baffled and disturbed by the silent presence, and the twins became increasingly withdrawn. They would often be left home early because of the bullying, so they can avoid leaving at the same time as the other children. They were diagnosed as elective mutes by a child psychiatrist and were transferred to the Eastgate Center for Special Education at the age of 14. Kathy Arthur, their new teacher, realized that the girls were speaking to each other when they were on their own. So she decided to record them in secret. She then realized that the secret language they were speaking was none other than English, although a very fast spoken version. In an attempt to help them, and by their own request, psychologists and family members decided to separate the twins, hoping that would encourage them to communicate with others and integrate into society. They had to decide which one would move to another school. This fact created a lot of tension and anger between them. They were shouting and screaming at each other, shocking everyone around. They decided that June was to stay at Eastgate, so Jennifer was transferred to another boarding school. The separation, however, had the opposite effect. Both girls became catatonic and refused to eat or engage with anyone. Their condition worsened rapidly, and the experiment was abandoned after a short time. The sisters left Eastgate at the age of 16. They isolated themselves at home, spying on the outside world through binoculars. They signed up for a course called The Art of Conversation hoping that it would help them talk to their family. Unfortunately, they did not succeed. At one point, they decided to become novelists. They could not speak and express themselves, so they would express themselves through their books, June said. Their writings provide a haunting insight into the isolated world and complex relationship. Their most popular books are The Pepsi Cola Addict and Discomania. In 1981, at 18 years old, they decided it's finally time to leave the bedroom and explore the outside. They started to hang out with two American brothers they met at Eastgate. The troubled boys committed arson, theft, and other crimes. They introduced us to glue sniffing, smoking cigarettes, and drinking vodka by the bottle, June recalled in her diary. A whole new world opened up to the sisters, a world of drugs, pleasures, and alcohol. As the twins fought over the boys, they grew more violent towards each other. Jennifer even attempted to strangle her sister one time. They started turning to life of crime and committing arson by burning down a tractor factory. 
The two of us were out of our minds. We were out of our depth, beyond help. So from going to being writers, we started destroying the town, vandalizing places, June said. Eventually, they were caught by the authorities. Once again silent, awaiting their trial, their own diaries became evidence of the crimes they committed. Pleading guilty to their crimes, the twins were admitted to Broadmoor Hospital under an indefinite detention sentence. They were diagnosed with an early stage of schizophrenia and needed a secure place for treatment, and Broadmoor was the only place that would take the twins in. The sisters were kept in separate wards. Initially, they were kept closer to each other, but they would start to argue and fight all the time. Keep them in the same room, they would fight. Keep them at a distance, they would stop eating and interacting with anyone. So it was decided to keep them separated under heavy medication. After two years, officially diagnosed as schizophrenic, they were given tranquilizers and started to communicate more freely, forgetting their shyness. They talked to each other only through letters when they couldn't visit each other. In a letter, Jennifer confessed that she believes that she might die young, way before June, but that it doesn't matter, that she hopes June will be happy. Even though they communicated more freely, the sisters were still not permitted to go home. For nearly 12 years, the girls lived at Broadmoor. Their only refuge was writing, so they wrote, page after page, diary after diary. June later summarized their stay at Broadmoor. We got 12 years of hell because we didn't speak. We had to work hard to get out. We went to the doctor. We said, look, they wanted us to talk. We're talking now. He said, you're not getting out. You're going to be here for 30 years. We lost hope, really. I wrote a letter to the home office. I wrote a letter to the queen, asking her to pardon us, to get us out. But we were trapped. In March 1993, a month before they would turn 30, they received permission to be transferred from Broadmoor to Caswell Clinic, a medium security facility in Wales. A day before the move, June said that Jennifer was acting strange. Her speech was slurred and looked weak. On the road to Caswell, Jennifer rested her head on June's shoulder and said, At long last, we're out. She drifted off and wouldn't wake up. Her condition worsened, and on the 9th of March, 1933, Jennifer Gibbons was declared dead. The reason? Acute myocarditis, an inflammation of the heart, which is not even fatal in most cases. While the official cause of death was believed to be the major swelling around the heart, Jennifer Gibbons' death still remains a mystery. There was no evidence of poison in her system or anything else unusual, and some said it was psychosomatic. The doctors at Caswell Clinic deduced that the medications given to June and Jennifer Gibbons at Broadmoor must have provoked Jennifer's immune system, but they also noted that June was given the same medications and was in perfect health upon arriving. After her sister's death, June wrote in her diary, I quote, Today my beloved twin sister Jennifer died. She is dead. Her heart stopped beating. She will never recognize me. Mom and dad came to see her body. I kissed her stone-colored face. I went hysterical with grief." Unquote. The story takes quite a turn after Jennifer's death. After a few days, June began to speak more freely, as if she did so all her life. Freed from the shadow of her sister, June began to open up to the world. She started communicating more freely, and in 1994, she was released from the hospital to begin a new life. June's reintegration into society was gradual but steady. She moved back to live near her parents and attempted to build a life of her own. The one silent twin began to find her voice, a testament to the profound change Jennifer's death had brought about. The story of the silent twins became known to the public thanks to Marjorie Wallace, an investigative journalist at the Sunday Times in London. Wallace reached out to the Gibbons family. Aubrey and Gloria welcomed her into their home and the room where June and Jennifer had created their own world. She discovered that June and Jennifer had been teaching themselves to write alone in their room. Surprised by their rich imaginative life, Wallace took the books home. Amazed that the girls, who hadn't spoken and were dismissed as zombies by the outside world, had such creativity. Driven by her fascination with the silent twins minds, Wallace visited June and Jennifer Gibbons in prison while they were awaiting trial. To her delight, 
the girls gradually began to speak to her. She believed her curiosity about their writings could convince the sisters to break their silence. They desperately wanted to be recognized and famous through their writings, to have them published, and to have their story told, Wallace recalled. And I thought that maybe one way of freeing them, liberating them, would be to unlock them from their silence. Although June and Jennifer were taken to Broadmoor, Wallace never gave up on them. During their time in the mental institution, Wallace continued to visit and coax words out of them. Gradually, she made her way into their world. I always liked being with them. They would have that bright little sense of humor. They would respond to jokes. Often we would spend our days together just laughing. But beneath the laughter, Wallace discovered the darkness within each twin. June's diaries revealed that she felt possessed by her sister, a dark shadow over her. Jennifer's diaries described June as a face of misery, deception, murder. Wallace's research revealed a deep-rooted disdain for each other. Despite their bond and devotion, the girls had privately recorded increasing fear of one another for over a decade. Wallace noted that June seemed more fearful of Jennifer, who appeared to be the dominant force. Throughout their relationship, Wallace observed June's wish to distance herself from Jennifer and Jennifer's dominant ways. According to her, the girls had a long-standing agreement that if one died, the other must begin to speak and live a normal life. During their stay in the hospital, they began to believe that it was necessary for one of them to die. And after much discussion, Jennifer agreed to make the ultimate sacrifice. The story of June and Jennifer is one filled with sadness, frustration, loss, and most importantly, change. A poignant exploration of twinhood, societal exclusion, and the depths of human psychology. Their journey from isolation to partial self-expression highlights the complexities of their unique bond and the profound impact of understanding and patience. It raises profound questions about identity, the nature of their extraordinary bond, and the psychological impact of extreme isolation. The Gibbons twins' story continues to fascinate psychologists, writers, and filmmakers. Their unique connection, coupled with the tragic tale, leaves a mark on our understanding of human relationships and mental health. Through their imaginative writings and the perseverance of those who sought to unlock their silence, we see a testament to the resilience of human spirit and the transformative power of compassion. Their lives remind us that even in the most silent corners, there is a world waiting to be heard and understood. Thank you all for joining me today. If you like what you saw, Please consider leaving a like and subscribing, it really means a lot and it helps out the channel tremendously. Again, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video, bye bye.